And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mark to go through our first activity. Uh, hi, folks. So um, as a, a method of segueing um, and as well weighing, I, I think what's most important to you in terms of uh, the different activities we can demonstrate today, uh, and as well in itself a surreptitious uh, method of uh, of demonstrating a new tool um, and, it, and its potential applications uh, within uh, a discussion such as this, uh, I do invite you to, to click upon the session three link in blue that uh, should be being presented to you in the, uh, on your screen now. Uh, and you'll find that you're brought over to a Microsoft form uh, and uh, are asked a question. So I'm actually going to share a screen that demonstrates the instructor experience of monitoring responses. Uh, I would note that your responses today are anonymous, uh, but I'm going to show what uh, what you do select and that also will help us guide uh, our workshop today. Sorry, yeah. Mark. Hi, sorry. So where should I click? Uh, could you explain one more time? Sure. Uh, so the blue text uh, adjacent to the word activity uh, as oh. the second point in this slide. Oh. On the slide. Thank you. Yep, no problem. OK. Uh, OK, so on uh, the screen that I've just freshly shared, uh, we're seeing we're seeing your responses come in. Um, oh, that's interesting. Actually, uh, seeing some that I didn't expect. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So we have twenty one people in here. So I'll refresh it a few more times, and uh, it it should auto refresh. Uh, auto so I'll, refresh. I'll, I'll, I'll have technology to take care of all of us, but uh, um, no. no um, that there, there are probably far more interesting ways to beat the system, but uh, there's no way for me to prevent you from selecting all of these options uh, or as well from replying multiple times. Uh, so please don't do that, folks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, Mark, to to do this so you can have a powerpoint presentation open you can embed a forum right in there for your students to click on they can go here ask a question you could do a poll quickly it all really kind of embeds through that whole system so um i think this is a, a neat way to actually start out a class as well to uh, if there was something that you wanted to get their feedback on or especially with the small class, if you are focused more on discussion, maybe you set out, here's four or five different things that we could talk about in our one hour synchronous uh, time together. What are the top things that we wanna link into? So that might be just a, an interesting way to figure out how to focus your class that day based on the material that uh, they would have been uh, asked to read and reflect on in the asynchronous parts of the course. You got it. Um, so what did you find? What did people say? Right. So um, I I think we'd more or less settled on um, taking a peek at, uh, I should say, an in-depth peek. We're, we've got um, content ready for everyone uh, to address all of these. And we may just kind of quickly touch upon all the others, but a more in-depth peek um, at student pages within Sakai, as well as uh, peer assessment within Sakai. And lastly, uh, quizzing in tests and quizzes, uh, which I, I didn't expect would be a point of much excitement to everyone, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to dig into it. It's always awesome. a topic of lively discussion. So those are all your slides, so I guess I don't have to do too much after I do my intro stuff. Sweet. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> So on to the next slide there, uh, just as a, a quick refresher on uh, the roadmap of the things that we're doing for these sessions. Here we're focusing in a little bit more around the course learning outcomes, but more so on assessment, because we've been hearing that loud and clear in terms of different types of assignments that uh, would fit within this environment. So um, I know that, uh, there we go. So on the fourth slide there, I know Mark's just getting that all organized. Uh, on the next slide is, <laughs> sorry, I know I'm talking faster than uh, the, the technology is able to go sometimes. 
So on the next one, it talks about um, the integrated course design. So we keep coming back to this in each one of our sessions, just to help you kind of ground how you structure the, the course. So with that being um, the idea of having your learning goals, and uh, you're on the next slide there too, Mark. Mm -hmm. Yes, there we are. Um, so this one is talking about your learning goals, so your course learning outcomes, together with the teaching and learning activities, which we talked quite a bit about last, last time. And now we'll focus in on this idea of the authentic assessment. So how do we do that in this environment? And when we think about that assessment, it's always important to really understand how we're moving through that cycle of what will the students have to do to demonstrate that they've achieved these learning outcomes. So what will they have to do? So you want them to engage in the, 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 the teaching activities that you've created, do the readings, go through some videos, um, and then thinking about considering the assessment that contributes to this learning, not just fully that not just like says, OK, you know, and you were able to regurgitate what I told you. But what is it that authentically allows you to uh, help them advance their learning and contributes to your ability to assess that? And also here that you ensure that it's also gradable. And that's an important thing for me and for everyone to think about as instructors in terms of what are you comfortable with grading? What is your time frame in terms of your abilities to, to grade things? What's your comfort level with doing with grading presentations orally and videos versus an essay? So important for you to consider all of those different pieces. So on the next slide, uh, just speaks to that idea of authentic assessment. So what is that? Authentic assessment, and we have a link here that we'll make sure that we provide, is actively engaging students in their own learning, uh, thinking about how do you take the assignments and connect that to their real life situations, making connections and forging relationships prior uh, between prior knowledge and skills. So what is it that they might have learned in some of their earlier courses and how do you bring that in and, and really help them make the connections across their curriculum, especially if this is a capstone fourth year course? What does that look like for uh, for these different types of assignments? Also, uh, provide multiple pathways for solutions and a diversity of perspectives. So again, at that higher level thinking for these fourth year students, how do they really pull together the things that they've learned over time in all of their courses? On the next piece here, we have a little bit about the benefits and challenges. So for uh, on the column on the, the left side there, you, it speaks to objective exams. So, you know, these are facts, these are fast grading. Um, you know, it's hard to really understand uh, the depth of their understanding because this is seen as things that are just quick, multiple choice, they know it or they don't. Sometimes there's a, a place for that, maybe weekly t tests and quizzes, just to keep them thinking about the material and, and check, in, check in to make sure they're kind of doing their reading. But what you want to do to align to those broader, bigger, more important um, fourth year class type of learning objectives is moving into a, to more of a higher, higher levels of Bloom's um, taxonomy. And so from here, we're thinking more of around essays. Maybe it's uh, you know doing interviews and reflecting on that, uh, creating content related to the course. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of these, the ways in which you can do that in the online environment. <clears throat> this one here, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we wanted to provide it to you to be able to think about um, what a authentic assessment is and is not. So traditional assessment really revol relies on some of that like forced choice. So picking something, the goal is to really understand, do they know the material? Do they know the content? Whereas moving into more of the authentic assessment is understanding, um, you know, thinking about relying on direct measures of targeted skills and get, it encourages divergent thinking, not just repetition and regurgitation. It promotes how uh, it, it speaks to how knowledge is created and thinking about research methodologies and 
as well as um, thinking about cooperation and collaboration with peers to understand knowledge. So this is where we really want, um, what, that's what we mean when we're talking about authentic assessment as opposed to those snapshots and the simplistic kind of ways in which uh, some assessment is done. And we understand that there's sometimes when you have large classes, sometimes it can be difficult to really think about what does that look like in an authentic way. But I definitely uh, think it's an, an important read and really important to consider as you think through the, the development of your assessments in your courses. So I am now just going to flip it right over to Mark and we're going to get into some of the um, interesting and different ways in which you might think about uh, providing authentic assessment types of activities for your students. Right, um, so uh, one of the uh, I think by popular demand uh, methods of exploring uh, students actual creation of course content, uh, synthesis of ideas and creation of new ideas. Uh, is the lessons tool within Sakai. Uh, so we we spoke a little bit about lessons as far as its ability to create um, weekly, daily, chapterly modules um, to support online learning. Uh, and we've actually uh, all month also been offering a workshop um, to to uh, explore usage of the lessons tool, which you're um, more than welcome to sign up for. Uh, the uh, space is fairly limited so far, so do do uh, consider it. Um, and uh, and if you're interested, uh, do rush there. Uh, although I, I think probably we'll be offering more at some point. Uh, so the lessons tool is a method of creating online modules. There is uh, typically a, a methodology for instructors to do it, but there is also a feature that allows instructors to give students the opportunity to, uh, in a very limited space, create their own online modules for sharing uh, with other students. Uh, so we've got uh, some snapshots here within this slide of some examples uh, that uh, are from a, a graduate course within the uh, the Master of uh, Public Health program taught by uh, Shanine McAlone. And uh, I, without compromising the identity of one of the students that was the author of this content, we've uh, we've taken a few snapshots with uh, with the instructor's uh, approval. And uh, effectively what these students in this uh, grad level course we're tasked with was uh, creating the weekly content that the course would then assess uh, and as well would uh, and I forget exactly what the the uh, the technique was that the instructor preferred but uh, would allow students to offer a little bit of feedback uh, we've we've got our own opportunities um, and uh, and plans for showing you how feedback could work with this tool today which we'll do um, so I'm going to now share uh, my other monitor, which has a view of Sakai and as well the steps for setting up uh, something that's uh, going to be able to facilitate student work within Sakai. Uh, so I'll be unsharing this slide. Apologies again for the uh, uh, for the whiplash that that provides. Uh, okay. Uh, so, something to add, Madeline? Or yeah, no, I was just going to say. I think uh, again at a, a fourth year, and this is uh, a master's class, but um, having students picking actual topics and uh, potentially working together to create an actual full lesson. Uh, so, say for the first six weeks, you create that synchronous material, and then questions to go in the forums. Maybe those last uh, number of weeks, the students actually create those. You provide them with feedback and uh, they come together and come up with questions as well for the forum. Because again, in that fourth year and in you know higher level thinking, we want them to be able to curate that great information depending on topics. So um, in, in some instances, depending on what your learning outcomes are, but I have found this is a really interesting and effective way. And students are often quite um, innovative in the things that they find to put into these lessons. So I'll, Mark, go ahead, I'll let you show them. No, I appreciate that, um, and I think as well uh, an opportunity to frame it for students uh, yeah, is very handy. Um, so what I what I actually intend to demonstrate today is uh, the enabling of the feature that allows uh, students to to do that work. Uh, this assumes, of course, that uh, the instructors already um, kind of framed usage of the lessons and and established expectations, and that can be, uh, I, I think. Uh, made very clear by directions, but also um, in this case, we've got some examples uh, of modules created by the instructor. 
Uh, so within um, the lesson one module, which we've already got a significant amount of content within, uh, we're going to add that particular segment that allows students to create their own content. So if we scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, uh, we'll see that uh, there's a list of um, students and it, you may recall or you may recognize some of your colleagues here and these may certainly not be student users at Brock, but uh, for the purposes of this site they are. Um, so this is the student pages area and uh, should one of our students within this course visit this particular lesson, uh, they'll first off they'll not be presented with an with a, a listing of all of their other um, colleagues within the course, but rather an opportunity to uh, add their own page. Uh, by doing so, I'm allowed also um, as as the instructor to create my own space if I'd like. I'm going to just add something so that there's some content to um, to stick to with this page. Okay, uh, so we can see that um, the the student Mark has created a page. Uh, but more importantly, let's also take a look at some of the opportunities, uh, not only for um, assessment that are available here, because we did address uh, a little bit the the nuts and bolts or the workflow that's critical, I think, for um, for any course, and in particular, um, a, a a latter year course where you'd like to offer up as much as much energy as possible uh, towards teaching. Um, so we'll start by setting some parameters around the grade book. In this case, we'll keep it nice and simple with 10 points. Um, we'll add a comments section at the bottom of a lesson. Now this uh, is similar to um, when one would see a comments area within uh, any sort of an online forum, uh, whether it's a website uh, outside of the broad context or within it. And we'll also enable a peer review section uh, within this area. So that is, um, I think this addresses a little bit the uh, the desire to not only have an instructor assess student work here, but also to have uh, students offer up, uh, in this case, private peer review of each other's work. Has a lot of advantages in terms of students uh, own own meta awareness of where they are within the course, where their learning could be and where um, other individuals that, that are in a similar place within their education uh, may be in their understanding of the course's content and also provides a different perspective um, on exactly how, how they want to assess the course's content through assessing the work of other students. Uh, so interestingly here, uh, there is a uh, an opportunity to add a sample rubric. Uh, now this one's just simply uh, provided as a boilerplate by the Sakai community. It may or may not be relevant to your course. I think that in a pinch it may be handy, um, but this this has a bit more of a focus on the creation of an online website rather than I think more in-depth exploration of um, uh, of, of theory uh, of, of, a, of a course. So some work I think in terms of uh, building these out might be a good idea. So we'll save this rubric uh, because this would be handy for students that undertake the grading uh, step here. And then we update it. Oops. Uh, so now students are, as part of the course's work, actually able to click upon uh, my content and uh, well, in this case, add a comment. We've not yet actually enabled the grading area uh, just yet because that timing has to line up with our delivery of our workshop today, uh, which is it's difficult to do within a small window. Uh, but students are certainly able to begin to add comments to um, this this lesson's uh, segment. Um, oops. So Mark, if you had had um, your whole entire lesson page kind of created, you were like, this is, uh, you know, this is my intro, here's a reading, here's some questions in a video, and you asked uh, the students in the class two per other student. So mm -hmm. Mark's a student, then there's two others. They have to go in and provide comments and constructive feedback and use the rubric to go through those kind of a peer assessment type of activities, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. Um, 
and, and there are lots of ways I think to facilitate uh, student peer evaluation. Uh, it maybe is not ideal in particular in a small course where um, other methods of getting feedback from students uh, I think are, are flexible enough uh, due to a smaller size. Uh, it's possible to have students submit their feedback uh, just to you as the course instructor and that can be done even through email if you prefer but also through the assignments tool uh, if you've got a large or medium ish course uh, allowing that to uh, feedback system to occur within the lessons tool can be quite handy uh, and that that's what this is able to facilitate excellent okay um going to pause. I, I, I very much appreciate that this was a fast demonstration of this process. Um, are there any any questions, any um, anything that perhaps I can help clarify with uh, with this lessons uh, student pages feature that we've just taken a peek at? Uh, folks are welcome to to raise their hand or if you just uh, like to to unmute yourself and ask a question, you're welcome to do that as well. So I guess while we're just waiting for anybody else um, with this, it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't mess up for a better term the actual lesson that I created as the instructor. It just adds on another sheet that the student could create their own content. So I might do something on so leadership styles. I do a big content uh, piece there, and then I ask them to add a page based on. Um, a question that I have about leadership styles. So they could they would go in and they would create their own page right at the bottom that of the material which builds on what I had done. Interesting. I hadn't even known that. That's a cool feature. <laughs> I, I used to I had them just make their own content, but I like the idea of how it could build on student pages or like from the professor's pages as well is a is an interesting way to to do that. Just, uh, All right, so I don't see any. <laughs> oh, sorry, I don't see any questions. So um, maybe we'll. Oh, sorry. It says the student page is visible to the whole class. Correct. It is, um, and and that's a, a default configuration. Although it can be made um, actually um, either anonymous or something that's only visible to the creator um, of the content, so the student that made the page and the instructor, of course. Uh, so there, there is some granularity there. Excellent. And you could potentially have it where it's uh, set up for the students to create, and then the instructor reviews it before it gets opened up to the other students. Right. Um, yeah, and I think that that was the process that you were dis uh, discussing uh, yesterday, Madeline, um, that allowed for almost um, a full term process to unfold itself as students uh, uh, I think both synthesize the course's content and as well um, allow their their own content to unfold um, and hopefully is finished by the end of the course. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so again, we go through these steps really quick just to give you an idea of the things that are out there. But definitely, if you're thinking, I want to do this, but I missed something here, uh, just get in touch with edtech at brocku.ca and, and Mark can help you out with that or the, someone on the team. Right. Um, so I think I'll draw us back to uh, to our slide very quickly. Um, oops. Just to recenter with where we are with respect to the course's content. There we are. Okay. Um, so uh, a, another opportunity that, um, that that we did put forth in the form that uh, the group I think had really just kind of lukewarm feelings uh, and interest regarding uh, was peer evaluation um, as facilitated within uh, Turnitin.com. Uh, turn it in, as you may have heard, is the um, that that's the the, the plagiarism um, technology, more or less, uh, been in use for for quite some time now. There are also some very good uh, feedback and peer feedback uh, features within that system that actually 
needn't use um, any of the the plagiarism or originality checking features that Turnitin offers up as well. So if uh, if you're just interested in allowing Turnitin's um, grading features to help help out you and your team of marker graders, uh, that's certainly something that can be explored. Um, and lastly, the uh, peer review uh, uh, feature that exists within that. Uh, as a, a quick note before we move on to, I, I think, other forms of assessment uh, and feedback, uh, peer review as, as a feature tends to be a little tricky to manage still. Um, we're finding in just in terms of um, setting out the window for students to submit and then the window for students to peer evaluate each other and then as well that third window for the instructor to um, offer that that final kind of capstone evaluation. Uh, there's a little bit of opaqueness in most tools that we've explored that offer up that feature. So um, if it is something you'd like to explore, a little bit of, of patience I think is definitely recommended. Uh, obviously, um, our team here at CPI is willing to, to, to help to test out to be uh, to be your test subjects um, and as much as is needed. Yeah, but just a heads up about that. OK. Um, so something else that is a uh, well, I brought a relatively fresh opportunity is, um, as you may know, uh, we're using Microsoft Teams for a lot of um, of um, class facilitation, including our workshop today. Um, but there is also a um, a complementary service called Stream that. Uh, houses all of the recorded videos, uh, and those can be meeting videos that you've created. Um, and that includes our recording today. Uh, we'll ultimately find uh, residents over in stream, uh, but as well uh, video that you've created elsewhere and choose to upload to stream in the same way that um, one would choose to upload a video to YouTube or um, to Echo 360, which is another option here at Brock for video streaming. Uh, it lives within stream and then um, can be shared with students uh, using some of the tools on that platform. Uh, we've not had a great deal of experience using it at Brock, although there is one um, one chemistry instructor that um, has actually been using it for uh, a first year course. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, uh, most members of Brock should be able to um, watch those videos after logging into stream. Uh, they've been made publicly available to the Brock community. Uh, and most notably, it's possible with stream to insert questions uh, interstitially throughout the video. So if students, for example, uh, watch the first five minutes and then um, as the instructor, you feel that they may need to check back on some of the information that they've um, that they've just observed um, or maybe just to kind of reinforce their understanding of what's gone on. Uh, it's possible to pause uh, and actually require students to make a choice in terms of a question uh, before the video proceeds. Uh, so that's actually, uh, that is something we're going to demonstrate today because I think it's uh, it's a handy feature moving forward. Uh, and we've also made, um, made an example that I think might be helpful um, to the workshop. So I'm going to switch to my other screen once again. Uh, so this is a video that I was uh, that actually Madeline um, kindly allowed us to use, um, and this is part of her um, her 5P14 um, course. But uh, we're actually going to head back to the video's start point. I think I've been static for too long here, and we're we're losing our our opportunities to play it. Okay, great. Uh, so the video plays as um, as you might expect, and th this includes on the student side as well. Uh, so at about a minute and 18 seconds, uh, the video is paused and then students are asked uh, a question to clarify. And in this case, it's, it's not a difficult one. Uh, in, in this particular example that, uh, that we've created, the goal is simply to um, have allow students an opportunity to take take action uh, based on the information that they've just gained, uh, and then also reinforce um, what it is, what's the correct option. And just so you know, he picked the right one. I don't make them do TikToks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we've. 
<laughs> we have observed there's a little bit of a lag time um, with uh, with switching from video to uh, the questions within a video. Uh, and incidentally, those questions are happening over in Microsoft Forms, uh, and that's where they're living. And I think that that's that's probably what the challenge is. Uh, and there's another question awaiting us uh, towards the end of the video, which uh, which I won't uh, I won't scroll to because that'll result in a little bit of uh, additional lag time, I think. Uh, Madeline, you had something to say? Uh, yeah, no, I just see that uh, Linda has a question if you wanted to unmute and ask that. Yeah, I see on the screen that it looks like there's a, a like closed captioning. Is that true with all the videos? Mark? Yes. Yes. Um, so videos are now being closed captioned uh, if they're recorded within um, within stream and uploaded there. Um, so it's I would note that it is automated captioning. Uh, so if you've got uh, an accent that is not California esque, uh, there is always an opportunity that uh, the robot that's doing the, this automation may miss you, um, or as well make some uh, some interesting assumptions about the words that you were intending to use. Uh, there there have been some particular challenges we've observed with highly technical language, uh, for mainly the reasoning that it's not everyday language. Uh, Algorithmically, it's if there's any question in the mind of the auto captioning, it's probably going to choose the thing that most people, by its assumption, on a regular basis, are going to use. In which case, uh, highly topical language might get missed. Um, but yeah, it does that, and it's very handy. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I guess uh, another just kind of quick piece about this: if you did have your your, so this was a, a video that I had just created fully and then Mark took it and put these forms in it. I didn't have to do it during the presentation. I think is important to highlight. You do this and then you embed it after. And again, we can help you figure out how that looks, but if it's something that you think would be an interesting option and you want to just kind of gauge students thinking or uh, I guess with the, the chemistry one, just as a quick example, he was doing some um, different types of procedures and then stopped and they had to answer what they would do next or what that uh, instrument was called and they would have to answer a question and then it would um, move on. So, you know, just is some different ways to think about uh, making some of that asynchronous, but it's still interactive. It's not just watching the video. They actually have to watch and answer something. So uh, definitely something to consider. Absolutely. OK, uh, if folks are comfortable. Oh, see, it doesn't look like, yeah, OK, so if folks are comfortable. We'll uh, we'll move on to uh, the next example um, that actually was was asked for by popular demand. So we'll um, we'll switch over to. Uh, Sakai once again, and in this case, we're actually taking a peek at the tests and quizzes tool, which was uh, that was our next slide uh, within the slide presentation, which uh, which we'll hop back to in just a few minutes. Um, so uh, testing, of course, can take a lot of different forms. It's possible to do uh, very high stakes end of term testing, which can be increasingly challenging in an online environment for uh, a good number of reasons. Uh, more potentially useful for your teaching and as well for uh, your students uh, undertaking of the course learning activities is um, a high frequency low stakes uh, quizzing that can be facilitated in a few different places within Sakai uh, and that um, includes directly within the lessons tool. Uh, I think there are some examples here. Yeah, I have some at the okay. bottom. Okay, right, yeah. Um, so there actually is a quiz um, that uh, ju again, just for the purposes of reinforcing what has gone on in the module that uh, that preceded it, uh, there's a quiz embed that was created in the test and quizzes tool in Sakai is embedded in the lessons tool uh, that when students click upon it, they're actually brought right to the quiz. Uh, on the instructor side, there are uh, a great many ways to create quizzes. Uh, typically, what I would recommend is creating a question bank uh, and then creating a test based on the questions that are in that bank. Um, one of the challenges with that, of course, is that it's a little bit of front loaded work, but it allows you to create some variety for your students. Uh, so if you've got, for example, a bank of 20 questions or 10 questions and 
for uh, the chapter one quiz students are asked just to answer five. Uh, the Sakai tests and quizzes tool can understand that uh, uh, it, it's important for this quiz to just randomly select five of the available 20 questions. Uh, this allows for a good deal of variety amongst students so that if there's a collaboration going on that you didn't intend for, uh, that I think is probably a lot less helpful to students and in fact might almost be, be beneficial if students are, uh, I think, tasked with uh, with coping through a variety of questions that are asked of them. Uh, so we'll, we'll quickly build um, a quiz here within the tool uh, because I think that one of the challenges with this particular test and quizzes tool in Sakai is getting started. Uh, it's not necessarily approachable. Um, oops. And I've cheated a little bit in that I've already created uh, a number of question pools, but uh, this process here is simply me mapping them to a new quiz that I'm creating freshly uh, right now. Uh, so our chapter two quiz has just been uh, created in theory. Uh, what we're doing in this process here is actually adding its content. Um, so we're going to choose to randomly draw questions for this quiz. Five questions from uh, an I do have sadly a little bit of a mess within um, uh, from all the testing I've done over, over the years, but uh, I think this looks proportionally OK. Uh, five questions randomly drawn from a pool that is in total seven. Uh, we're not able to exit the page without making a selection here. Uh, it's a good idea to choose that incidentally. <laughs> Uh, so I've now mapped the um, the five question pool to the quiz, uh, and when I choose to publish the quiz, uh, th those those two will more or less be connected to each other. Uh, I'm going to see how far we can get quickly with this process. Okay. OK, so we've now published a chapter two quiz that students will be able to um, to undertake. And um, uh, I, I won't necessarily preview this one, but um, I would note that it is possible to embed it now now that it's published within the lesson itself. Um, let's add it here. Chapter two, all right. OK. Uh, and this is not necessarily respectful, I think, of the vision that the instructor initially had for this module, but uh, uh, this is the technical step for adding the quiz. Uh, <clears throat> let's take a peek at the student experience now. Uh, so there is a, uh, a handy student view and available in a few places within Sakai, in fact, but um, the one that uh, for the purposes of quizzing that I'd like to point out is the preview feature that's available in the, in the select action menu for um, for any quiz that is is available. Um, and then if you've not seen the tool before, uh, all of the typical question opportunities uh, like true and false fill in the blank. Um, short response and long response questions are certainly all offered up. And this is a, a, an essay or a longer response question, I believe. Um, the uh, from the administrative perspective, any quizzes that you've chosen to um, to make available to your students can be automatically assessed. In particular, if a question format that uh, can be easily auto graded has been selected, uh, that involves, of course, matching questions, multiple choice, uh, true false, and uh, those can be um, after. Uh, automatically tabulated can be added to the gradebook tool within your Sakai site and again save you a little bit of administrative effort uh, as far as your um, uh, your facilitation of the course. It can also um, 
uh, on the other side of that opportunity allow for, I think, a very um, a very valuable opportunity for students to reinforce what they've just learned on a, uh, a chapter by chapter or a module by module basis. I think what's uh, really neat in that as well is if a student picks the, the wrong answer, you can also just uh, enable the display feedback immediately uh, aspects. So you can show them, sorry, incorrect, check out page whatever on our in this reading to clarify your thinking about this topic or you can actually write in no actually the answer is this or if they get it correct you might want to put something reflective in there is I, I guess it depends on the the amount of questions you're going to create what your intent is again this idea of authentic assessment in terms of uh, what you're wanting them to get out of that quiz if it's just like clearly they need to know then you know it's right or it's wrong but if you want them to answer it and then be able to provide them with a little bit more reflection on that. Uh, I think that's a really nice, uh, really nice feature. Then I know we are, we only have 15 minutes left, yeah. Mark. What do you think it would be our best way to uh, move forward here? So I think we'll head back to the PowerPoint presentation if that's all right. Yeah. And, uh, okay. And then I can kind of breathe, not breeze over, but I can uh, run through a few of the other uh, points that we had in terms of assessment. I think was mine, right? Yeah. You want, yeah, you want to speak to that one? Go ahead. Oh, um, yeah. So I, 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 I don't want to cover this too, too. Uh, I, I think too broadly, but. Um, even in a pandemic environment, it's still possible to allow students to um, offer up an interview with an expert within uh, any respective field. Um, if uh, and, and of course, because of the various different types of media we've got available uh, both at Brock and uh, externally and potentially freely across the web, uh, students are able to communicate with and uh, and record their discussion with um, with members of, of many different types of communities. Uh, as far as how you plan on receiving that from students, uh, it's always good to be flexible. As we note at the bottom of the slide, uh, students, of course, can self host a lot of content. So if they've interviewed uh, someone, there's an audio file somewhere that's been part of, or, or rather is the artifact of that effort, uh, either allowing students to submit that to you or to share it to you from somewhere across the web can be handy. Um, and if uh, if that first option is not available, the uh, arguably the value of um, of experiencing an interview with uh, an expert in what is going to be a prospective field for a student is getting a sense of what the particular values in that field are, and as well allowing a student to construct questions that are pertinent to to addressing that. Uh, so this uh, um, this we believe is very re relevant to the authentic assessment side of uh, assessment for your course and might be a helpful and handy exercise in that regard. Absolutely, and it also connects that idea of theory to practice. So understanding what an expert knows about the theory that you're teaching in them in the class, having that assessment allows them to achieve that learning outcome. So on the next one um, here, we have a uh, real world observation. So in a number of the things that I've been reading is uh, thinking about how do you create, and I don't like this real world uh, kind of comment, but just an observation of what's going on in the current environment. Is your topic conducive to students going for a walk and seeing how something in their environment connects to your material? Could they do an observation and a reflection on this? I know that might not be possible, but uh, uh, you know, as restrictions lift, if you're in um, a history class, is there a way in which students can can uh, visit a historical site and provide an observation on that? Is there, you know, a way for them to be out in the environment and observing people being physically active? And what does that look like? And what does that mean? So I, I think that's uh, something definitely to consider as we know that our city, our students are going to be sitting behind computers constantly with online learning. So how can we give them something that takes them away from that electronic focus and really allows them to connect that into the broader kind of community environment? So that's a, another definitely a great type of assignment to think about. Uh, the next one there is um, 
what I'd like to call quick writes, and I don't know if anybody else has used this in class, but uh, definitely at the end of class, I often say, okay, write down just, you know, your three quick takeaways and, uh, or what are your muddy points? So after doing this lesson, what are you still not clear on? Or what, what did you think was really neat or that really helped your motivate your thinking around this topic? And even just opening that up in a, a forum or opening that up for, you know, here you have an hour after we do some kind of discussion in class together to just write out a few, a few things that you're thinking about. So I think uh, the key with that is that you can use that to actually drive the discussions that you have the next time in, in in anything synchronous or drive the creation of your asynchronous materials that you put online. But also you could use that as an assessment of engagement and participation. So uh, definitely something that you could potentially consider. Now on the next slide here, we also have um, what we it's just kind of very rudimentary. I was like trying to think of like how do I how do I position this? But uh, thinking about what we talked about last week with predict uh, flexibility and empowerment of students and allowing them the opportunity to really uh, reflect and engage in their own learning, uh, it might be that you're able to create something around here's the topic of your class, here's two questions that they could consider uh, and they could identify which one looks more interesting to them and then they can kind of branch off and you could give them different options. So for question one, maybe they do a video assignment or a picture assignment they could you know get a picture and talk about what does that mean related to that question and topic so thinking about it almost like in a bit of a, a model like this allows for a little bit more creative creativity for students and some empowerment for them to think about uh, how they can demonstrate their knowledge but still achieve the outcomes that you want them to do but they can do it in a way it's creative and interesting for them. So that's, uh, you know, just kind of a visual to think about in terms of does everything have to be the same? It, again, depends on your comfort level as a, as a faculty member and an instructor in these courses, but definitely as uh, something that we we know can help to really drive thinking and engagement in, cl in the class in general. And on the next slide, I think we just have our wrap up and we still have 10 minutes. So uh, really what we would like to do is if there's anything, any questions that you have, we'll, we can talk about those now or you're welcome to sign off. Next week, what we'll do is really think about how do we bring all these three sessions together and kind of help you plan moving forward. And uh, if there's anything else that you're interested in thinking about or you want us to look up and bring to you and, and show you here in these sessions, definitely put it in the chat and we can follow up on that as well. So I think that's it. So any questions? Um, if you want to do a midterm term or final exam in an online course, what suggestions can you make about format? Mark, I'll let you take that one. That that's a huge question. Um, so I, uh, I think from the perspective of now that we're all online um, and presumably in a lot of cases, um, the goal with um, large scale tests is to ensure that each individual students are able to uh, demonstrate knowledge uh, using a method that, um, I mean, based on the course is is um, uh, is what you've kind of isolated as as what you need to see. Um, not relying too much on uh, didactic information or the, the sorts of knowledge that can be easily traded amongst students and instead giving students an opportunity to relate what you're asking them back to something that is part of the personal context or is heavily application based uh, can um, can help with um, with making sure that 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 kind of big scale or a large scale assessment is robust. Um, as far as format goes, uh, it's it's really difficult to do something big uh, in the, the the tests and quizzes tool kind of um, scenario. There, there are, of course, instructors that are doing it. Uh, there are a range of challenges from the technical to the administrative, uh, and I should say even to, towards the academic, because then of uh, students may collaborate when you don't intend for them to. Um, but the the more 
uh, I think, flexible kind of take home exam or open book exam that is looking more for students to to apply information or apply knowledge um, in a way that doesn't necessarily just challenge. Do you remember um, this bit of information from chapter three uh, can be helpful? So uh, again, to drill down even further, uh, maybe more granularly trying to stick to tools like the assignments tool, uh, which does a really good job of facilitating um, uh, take home exams and uh, and and things like that, uh, and it's also very uh, approachable from the perspective of students needing additional time, or who, who have um, challenges around learning environment. Uh, giving them a, a kind of wide window to make those submissions can also work. I would also say um, around the idea of having cases, so they have something that they have to read right there and then, and then they have to answer questions about that uh, would would make for a better format in that sense. So um, instead of just like Mark said, you know, anything you can just Google, like, you know, they're doing it. I have two screens. They just Google and they answer the question. But if they have to read something, consider it, apply their knowledge into answering those questions. I think that would be more effective in this uh, kind of environment. Now, there is another question uh, from uh, David. So in an asynchronous course, perhaps two second and third year courses, third year, how far should we allow students to work ahead? Could they treat it as a super course and complete it in a matter of a few weeks? <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting. Um, I so with my courses again I try to modulate them so you know for for the one month here's like four lessons and then they have an assignment due uh, some students will do all of them and then get the assignment done and submit it like I'm like floored that that's happening but I think the key with that from my perspective would be um does the knowledge that they're doing have to do they have to build on that knowledge over the term or is it very specific different types of um, material so if it's so I think about my the first year course I used to teach we had one week on uh, cancer one was on obesity one was on health systems none of that really built on each other it was all very specific uh, section so they could have done any of that at any time throughout the semester uh, so I think that's the consideration in terms of could they just work through it all and get it done? Uh, I guess it depends on your approach and what your needs are and how much time they need to do certain assignments. But it's a good question. Um, I, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Uh, I, I would add as well that if there's a, a collaborative aspect to that course, so um, uh, a forums component or a teams component uh, or a small group component where um, folks need to all be generally at the same stage of understanding um, the course's content, uh, allowing uh, an opportunity, whether technically or organizationally, for students to kind of rush forward and, and, and drive through the whole course uh, because perhaps there's a reason that they'll need to. Uh, they That might be to the disadvantage of other learners uh, who, uh, again, to facilitate that community aspect of the course, uh, will need everybody roughly to be at the same stage Right. The other thing, too, is, uh, you know, getting it all ready yourself. So I still find myself working on the final uh, three weeks of the lesson for uh, the end of July and, and August. Um, so I think that's obviously a, a personal consideration as well. But it's a it's an interesting thought. And I think, um, you know, if if there was a way to kind of create those courses and those different opportunities that provides that level of flexibility for students. And just as an aside, uh, we did do a research project based on knowledge retention for students who did accelerated versus like traditional six uh, or 12 week courses. And the retention rate was pretty much exactly the same for accelerated versus uh, traditional. So again, I'm kind of torn between these. I think it's definitely possible uh, depending on how the content comes together for you and your course. Other questions or comments? All right. Well, I'm seeing none. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just stay on here. I'd like to thank everybody for coming uh, once again. And I hope that there's a few tidbits in here that uh, are helpful to you as you think about planning and designing your course. 
Uh, next week, again, we'll, we'll think about what does it look like about finalizing your plans and moving forward. And any questions that you have, please feel free to uh, get in touch with us and we can help you in between as well as you're thinking through these pieces. Well, thank you for coming, folks. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you were on sabbatical this year. Guess not. <laughs> it will start. It will start <laughs> January. So I have to prepare. <laughs> well, well good yeah, luck. But this is great. Thank you so much for all these, you know, great workshops. I'm really enjoying and learning a lot. So that must be a lot of work for you guys, but uh, really appreciate it. No problem. We we do enjoy doing them. That makes us think about our stuff as well. And uh, it's good to be able to record them. And I just saw that uh, Kelly's asking where they are. Uh, we'll send we'll put in the link right in here, Kelly, to uh, where you can find them. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Thank Bye. you. Bye bye.